Very good evening to all of you once again. I'm ever so thankful that you all could join me every time, every day. Thank you. We left off in 2 Samuel 16 last time where Absalom has taken the throne from his father David. Ahithophel has joined up with him. Bathsheba's grandfather, Ahithophel, has now joined league with Absalom. He has just given him counsel to go and lay with the ten concubines of David out on the very roof in which he viewed Bathsheba to begin with and created all of this horrendous, these are horrendous events. But we're going to be going over the death of Absalom today, chapters 17 and 18. We're going to be doing two chapters a day for the next four days in order to get through Second Samuel, and then we'll pick the narrative back up in First Kings, Lord willing. But until then, we see David, he's fled Jerusalem. He is now out in the wilderness, the same kind of hopeless attitude that he had whenever Saul was hunting him, and he fled into the Philistine land. There's a reason why I'm bringing this up. It'll come up a little bit later in this study. But now we pick up in 2 Samuel 17. Absalom is now viewed as the king of Israel. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. Keep track of this. Ahithophel says, let me lead 12,000 men to hunt David. And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid, and all the people that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. That... Is kind of that must have been an awkward moment. Ahithophel calling David the king to Absalom, who thinks that he's the king now. That may have had an effect on a negative effect on this advice, as it was actually good advice. Ahithophel was known for giving very wise counsel. It even ends the chapter of Second Samuel 16 by saying that he has his counsel was as the oracle of God. And I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned. So all the people shall be in peace. This is good advice. Ahithophel is telling Absalom, we need to attack David right now. We need to get him before he crosses the Jordan. If he crosses the Jordan, he'll have time to set up the battlefield in his favor and all of this. And he'll be able to get um, allies helping him. And the saying pleased Absalom well, and all the elders of Israel. That struck me, and all the elders of Israel. How long? David had been their king for 40 years, and here the elders of Israel, or 33 years in Israel. But 40 years total, 40 years and 6 months. And here they are turning on David, all of them. And it's not the young men. It's the elders of Israel that are plotting to kill David now. It's bizarre. Then said Absalom, Call now Hushai the Archite also, and let us hear likewise what he saith. Remember how we had already went over in previous studies about how Absalom is being this politician. He's, all, he's pretty good at being a politician. He's pretty good at playing this part. But he's not a military genius. He has nowhere near the kind of wisdom that David has acquired over all these years, and he's not a man of God. So he calls in another person. Now, after gaining this good counsel from Ahithophel, he says, well, bring in Husha, the archat. Let, let, let's hear what he said, just like a politician. I want to hear what he has to say. And when Husha was come to Absalom, Absalom spake unto him, saying, Ahithophel hath spoken after this manner. Shall we do after his saying? If not, speak thou. Now do remember how David had sent Hushai in to be a spy and to give bad counsel in order to hopefully thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. So he, he sends Hushai in as a spy. So Hushai is actually acting in the best interest of King David. And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. For, said Husha, thou knowest thy father and his men that they be mighty men, and they be chafed in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field, and thy father is a man of war, and will not lodge with the people. 
Behold, he is hid now in some pit or in some other place, and it will come to pass when some of them be overthrown at the first, that whosoever heareth it will say there is a slaughter among the people that follow Absalom. And David certainly has the more mighty veterans on his side. Absalom may have the numbers, but David, he has the experience on his side. And he also that is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, shall utterly melt. For all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which be with him are valiant men. As I've reckoned in prior studies, how these are probably the best fighters in the world. The, the, these are giant slayers that are with David, Joab and all of and Abishai and such. Therefore, therefore I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee, from Dan even to Beersheba is the sand that is by the sea for multitude, and that thou go to battle in thine own person. What he is counseling Absalom for right here is going to take a month, two months. It's going to take a while for them to gather all the armies of Israel. And you got to think it's coming from the north, south, east, and re and west. So there's going to be a lot of them. It's going to take a lot of time. They're going to have to get the battle plan formed and the regiments figure out where David is and spies. They they're going to have to learn a lot of the terrain. This is going to take a lot longer than what Ahithophel had counseled. Ahithophel just said, "Let me take a few thousand men. I'll go and I'll kill the king only, and that'll be it." Which uh, who knows may have worked. I still don't think that Ahithophel would have succeeded in doing that. David, he's just got much stronger men. Now, these aren't supermen. I'm not trying to put them on the level of like Iron Man and Incredible Hulk or any of these, but, but they know how to fight. They're fearless, and they're fighting these younger men in whom are terrified of them. They've heard stories about how they've killed these giants and everything, killed far more giants than David has. And David being the leader of them, the giant killer of them all. Notice how Husha says, And that thou, speaking to Absalom, and that thou go to battle in thine own person, instead of Ahithophel leading this, these, this brigade or whatever, these troops, instead of Ahithophel being the leader and gaining the victory, Husha says, No, king, you should take all the army of Israel, and you should lead them. He's... You know, he's playing on that pride of Absalom. And Absalom, he's a very proud man. He wants to be a victorious like his father. And he wants to be known as this military genius and leader and victor, conqueror, if you will. And who better to conquer than King David? So shall we come upon him in some place where he shall be found, and we will light upon him as the dew falleth on the ground, and of him and of all the men that are with him there shall not be left so much as one. Ahithophel says, let me take a few men on up there and we'll kill the king and then we'll come back. What Hushai is saying is, you should take Absalom. You should gather all of our armies and go up there and wipe out all of them, not just David. So what Hushai is saying is it will be a much greater victory. It'll stand out and you will lead them. Moreover, if he be gotten into a city, then shall all Israel bring ropes to that city, and we will draw it into the river until there be not one small stone found there. That's quite amazing how he's using such poetic language. He's trying to make this seem like the most epic of victories. If David goes into a city, we'll tie the city with ropes and drag it all on in there. We'll destroy him is what he's trying to put into his mind. This would be the greatest victory Israel has seen. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the, count, the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. So you see the, the hand of the Lord in Hushai's words. God could see into the heart of Absalom and tell that he was a proud man, so he plays on that. He says, okay, you want to be a great king? Well, do this. And it, what it's doing is it's going to buy David time to cross the Jordan, set up his battleground, put his troops in, in line, refresh themselves. It's going to totally set Israel in a, at a disadvantage against King David. Then said Hushai unto Zadok and to Abiathar the priest, Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. So he's running to um, Zadok and Abiathar the priest, 
because David said, you'll be my spy, Husha, and whenever you learn anything, go and tell Zadok and Abiathar, and then they'll send word to me. That way I'll know. So these are the messengers. He's trying to get the message to him. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. He says, just in case Absalom changes his mind, hurry up and cross the Jordan. He's trying to get him across the Jordan just as quick as possible. Now Jonathan and Ahamaz stayed by Enrogel, for they might not be seen to come into the city. And a wench went and told them, and they went and told King David. All that a wench is is a, uh, I believe that's the only time in the Bible that it actually uses this word, but it's just a, uh, like a poor servant girl. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but they went both of them away quickly and came to a man's house in Bahram, which had a well in his court, whither they went down. Obviously, David has, so a young boy, he sees him. Uh, well, not a young boy. He's probably 20, 20, 21, 22, something like that. He's a lad. That's what they would refer to him as. But obviously, David still has allies. And it's believed that David has allies because some of the favor of Absalom was tainted by him taking the ten concubines of David out on the roof and publicly laying with them, a treacherous act. All leaders can attest to how badly philandering taints their legacy whenever they're seen with this woman and this woman and this woman. And it it gives fodder to their, to their enemies to th uh, fuel that fire of hate upon them. We see this with Donald Trump. They still talk about all these things that he said about women and how he's sexist and he uses women for objects and the stormy daniels incident these porn stars and prostitute you'll hear about everything with donald trump they use that against them well the same thing i believe happened with absalom whenever he took david's 10 concubines that probably set in all of israel's mind whenever they heard about it or at least some in israel they probably said man what a horrible thing to do what an embarrassment. And he did it at the, he was going by the advice of Ahithophel. So Ahithophel gives bad advice, go out and lay with your father's concubines on the roof. Ahithophel gives Absalom bad advice and Absalom takes it. Now Ahithophel's probably given him the most logical, reasonable advice and Absalom doesn't take it. He disregards it. So this is um, uh, showing very much inexperience on the part of Absalom, at the very least. Also, the hand of the Lord is involved here, but I believe the hand of the Lord is using Absalom's inexperience against him. So we see these two messengers. They're hiding from the servants of Absalom. They know that it's certain death if they're caught. So, and the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground corn thereon, and the thing was not known. They go down into this well. She covers up the well. No one looks down it. No one thinks a thing about it. And they get away with it. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman to the house, they said, Where is Ahamaz and Jonathan? And the woman said unto them, They be gone over the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. It so reminds me of Rahab, what she does for the two spies. Right here we see an unknown Rahab playing out. And it came to pass after they were departed that they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said unto David, Arise and pass quickly over the water. For thus hath Ahithophel counseled against you. Then David arose and all the people that were with him, and they passed over Jordan by the morning light. They lacked not one of them that was not gone over Jordan. Now this would have taken a while. You have to remember, David, he has, I would say, wild guess, but I would say that he probably has about 4,000 people with him, three or 4,000 people, a lot of army, the, their wives, their children, maybe 5,000 plus people with him. The Jordan River is not a very wide body of water. In most spots, it wouldn't take very long to get across if you're just wanting to get across yourself. If you'll remember, the Jordan River is where um, 
Joshua led the people into the promised land. Uh, Jesus was baptized. It's about 156 miles long, so it's a long river, but wide as far as crossing it. It, I think it's anywhere from 1,300 feet to 10,000. So you're looking at not very far at all, especially back then. It may have been wider. I don't know. But right now it's about a quarter of a mile across some and uh, some spots, and then other spots it can get up to, uh, I think it's 1.8 mile across. So it's it, it's not a very like massive body of water or anything, but for such a um, an army, thousands of people with David, it would have taken a while for all of them to get across. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. So Ahithophel, his advice is not heeded by... Absalom. And so he goes, he sets his affairs in order, he gets his house done. It, something that reasonable people would be able to do. And then he does a very irrational act and goes and hangs himself. There's been a little bit of dispute over why he hanged himself or hit the fell. He's an old man at this time. He's about 80, I would think, somewhere in, in that area, about 80, maybe older. But he hangs himself not because his advice wasn't heeded. That's only part of it. Many people believe that his feelings got hurt. You know, I, well, the king's not listening to me, so now I'm just going to go kill myself. That's not why he did that. Ahithophel was known as one of the wisest men in all of Israel. He had the, the foresight to see that because... Hushai's advice is now heeded. It's going to take longer. David is going to be able to establish battle lines and a plan how to defeat them. He's going to choose the terrain to beat them. He knew how smart David was. He had known David most of his life. He also knew Joab and Abishai and Ittai. He knew all of these mighty men of war, and he knew that it was doom. Doom was coming, and he probably feared that David would put him to death. Joab would have him killed in the middle of the night or something. That's the way Joab did. He didn't care, as we'll even see one of those examples in this study. But it's because he knew that it was all over at that point. Absalom was a dead man. Then David came to Mahanaim, and Absalom passed over Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. So David has made his way to Mahanaim right here in Gilead, and this right here is where they believe that Absalom showed up at Jabesh Gilead. David would have been here for several weeks, I'm believing, if not a month or so before Absalom was able to show up. Plenty of time to get everything ready. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab, which Amasa was a man's son whose name was Ithra, an Israelite, that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zeruiah, Joab's mother. In other words, Absalom sets Amasa over the army. Who is Amasa? Amasa is Joab's cousin, more specifically the son of David's niece. So Israel and Absalom pitched in the land of Gilead. And it came to pass when David was come to Mahanaim that Shobad, the son of Nahash of Rabal of the children of Ammon, and Mechir, the son of Emiel of Lodabar, and Barzili, the Giladite of Rogelim. The reason why it's mentioned, these are the people that helped David. So the Bible is God desires to honor these people because though they weren't soldiers, they brought, they brought uh, provisions, food, beds and all of that for David's army, which really played a key part in the, uh, their victory. Brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David and for the people that were with them to eat, for they said the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. And David numbered the people that were with them and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. 
And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. I really do like what David's doing here. He's separating this army into three different camps. Napoleon was known for being such a tactician. He had this guerrilla warfare style that was foreign to most of the other nations. They would usually just line up and let one another shoot back and forth, something crazy. But he would actually separate them. There would be ambushes, guerrilla tactics. It was uh, fascinating to see. He was like a chess player. So David is wanting to lead them into the battle. Remember, David, he's 70 years old at this time. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die, will they care for us. But now thou art worth ten thousand of us. Therefore, now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. Meaning, you can bring reserves for us, David. You can help us more by being apart from us. Stay here and we'll go and fight this battle. But I also believe there was a little bit of an ulterior motive here. I'm guessing that Joab especially did not desire David to come into the battle simply because if Absalom were to come into the target range of any of these warriors, he didn't want David to interfere. Joab knew it's far better for us to kill Absalom, and he knew that David would have no part of that. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. But notice what happens. All the armies start coming around, and these three generals are standing in front of David, Joab, Abishai, and Ittai the Gittite. They're all standing there, and D David tells them this in front of all the army. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard check that out and all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning absalom so david said it loud enough he didn't want to disrespect their authority you know there's a rank and file system here but you get the feeling that he announces this to the entire army it's an accountability measure he's trying to make sure that they all know don't hurt absalom that's a quite a request and joab he probably knew Joab, and Abishai would have no part of that. <laughs> so he's telling everybody, you know, make sure that nobody hurts Absalom, especially these two guys. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. So David got to choose this kind of a location, a wooded era, uh, area. And I do not believe that it's a coincidence whatsoever that history is repeating itself in David's life. It's almost as if God is putting David through the exact same motions that he had him at before he became king. It's like, remember, because whenever, before David ever took the throne as a young man, <clears throat> probably 29 years old or so, right before Saul's death, David lived in the land of the Philistines, which was in the city of Ziklag. And he lined up to go to war against his enemy at that time israel he was gonna go to battle against them and the philistines they didn't trust him so they sent him back to ziklag now we see at the end of david's life he is dethroned he's he's not on the throne once again just like before he's not on the throne of israel israel is his enemy and now he's getting ready to fight them again so history is certainly repeating itself for david what a humbling experience uh, now he now i'd say that he can look at his life and say god most certainly is the reason why i ever even ascended to power to begin with notice also how david chooses a uh, wooded terrain this would have nullified the number advantage that israel had over him david probably only had three four thousand men three or four thousand men and israel probably showed up with thirty forty fifty thousand men where the people of israel were slain before the servants of david and there was there a great slaughter that day of twenty thousand men so we do know that twenty thousand men died during this time for the battle was there scattered over the face of the 
of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. That's quite the strange statement, and I believe that that also shows us how, first of all, God, his hand is at work in this, obviously. He laid it upon David's heart to choose such a wooded terrain. And God also can use the, the natural resources around, all around them, in order to um, go into David's favor to win the battle. I really like Joseph Benson, his commentary on this. Some think the wood is said to devour them because they fell into pits or stumbled upon stumps of trees or pressed one another to death as they came into straight places or were killed by a wild beast. He goes on, but the most natural meaning of the words is that there were more slain in the wood into which Absalom's men fled than in the open field. That is, more in their flight, which was stopped by the wood, than in the battle. He's saying that they fled, ran into the wooded area, and Israel, or David's men, stalked them down and killed them while they were on the run. I would personally, I would believe both. I believe that he's given really good comments on both possibilities there. I believe that God could have used stumps, pits, wild beasts, all of these things in order to um, entrap them, kill them. But also you can look at <clears throat> them fleeing, running into trees, blinded, can't see Israel. There's all kinds of advantages whenever you go into the woods. And Absalom met the servants of David. And Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. I actually read a couple, a couple of comments about why did he ride a mule into the battle? Why not a horse? He's got all these riches, all these horses. He could have easily have brought a horse, but... The kings would often ride upon mules whenever they were uh, being, whatever, sworn in, ceremonial purposes. That was just the way that they did it. Jesus, he rode a, a mule into um, uh, Jerusalem a few days before he was crucified, showing him to be a king. Well, Absalom, I believe, rode upon a mule in order to show himself as the humble king coming in and his confidence in how he would win the battle. In the definition here of catching his hair or his head called hold of the oak, it has that whenever you look it up, there's a couple of different uh, ways that that played out. The common belief is that his hair got entangled. Absalom was known for his long hair. Being Jewish, it may have grown kind of outward, you know, and uh, curly outward and all, which would be very likely to get caught in the woods. I used to hunt as a um, teenager and such, and I used to hunt for years. I hunted squirrels, rabbit, deer, you name it, doves. We'd hunt open field for doves and all these coyotes. We'd hunt everything. And you run into limbs, cobwebs. I mean, you are just, uh, it's just such a burden sometimes. Whenever you're just walking, well, you're just hoping that you can make it on out briars. You can walk right in. I've been scratched all. But um, it also has that feel that he got caught by the neck. I don't take that point of view simply because if you get like hit in the neck and snagged in the neck, then you can get yourself out of that. It's very rare that you can get, you know, that you can be hanging by your neck in a tree. I'm not saying that that's not the way that it happened. But uh, it says that his head caught hold of the oak. Well, your hair is attached to your head. So it doesn't have to tell us specifically that it was his hair that got caught in it. But that's kind of what it's meaning right there. I would believe the hair because have you ever had gum stuck in your hair? Something stuck in your hair that's, you know, it, it's like it's impossible to untangle it. The hair is just everywhere. So, But I would also regret not making the common comment on, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the, the mule that was under him went away. The common teaching on that, and it preaches good, is that there was no place found for him 
on in heaven or in earth anymore. Even the earth didn't want him at the end of his life. Such an abominable man. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. This girdle would have been a ceremonial belt that they would have had given to, it's meaning I would have given you a promotion. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou mightest, and thou thyself wouldest have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I might not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. <laughs> I get a kick out of the verbiage here. You can so tell Joab's personality. It just shines right through the Bible. He says, I may not tarry thus with thee. What that means is I'm wasting my time with you. Get out of my way. <laughs> he's. You can so tell he's that man's man kind of kind of guy. He's that guy that's just, that, just move. I'll kill him myself. You know, he's, he's agitated at life and everything. But Joab, he makes sure that he's dead. This was to the benefit of Israel, of David. He knew that David would not ever want this. But Joab, being David's nephew, once again, he knew, I'll talk to my uncle, everything will be fine. Now catch this. And ten young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. Ten young men. Ten young concubines that Absalom had slept with. David's concubines were ten now we see ten young men compassed about and all of them started just massacring Absalom, massacre. And Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing after Israel, for Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him and all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. And you can tell he, Joab, he didn't want any kind of special place to bury Absalom. He didn't want a ceremony to be held. He said, throw him in this hole in the dirt. Throw him there, put some rocks over him, and that's it. He, he, he knew Absalom deserved nothing special. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name, and it is called unto this day Absalom's place. I would believe that, and they actually believe that this is the uh, what Absalom built, Absalom's place, if you will. It still stands to this day. That's if it is. There's some debate. Some believe that it was built around 100 uh, B.C., about a thousand years later after they claim Absalom built this. I don't know. But also it's quite strange how it says, Absalom said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. We read not too long ago how Absalom had three sons. So it is assumed that they all died. Then said Ahamaz, the son of Zadok, let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day thou shalt not bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. He's basically, Joab is saying, Look, you're a friend to David. You don't want to tell David what has just happened. He knows his uncle. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed himself unto Joab and ran. I would assume that... Joab or Cushai is not really very familiar to David. He's just a common soldier. And Joab didn't want a friend of David delivering such harsh news. Then said Ahamaz the son of Zedek yet again to Joab, But howsoever let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? He says, I've already sent word for what you're going to say. 
But howsoever said he, Let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then Ahamaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushai. And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall, and lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried, and told the king, and the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. What David is saying here is that we know that he's a messenger. He comes to bring news. He's not just someone fleeing from the battle. If he's by himself, he's just a messenger. And the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahamaz the son of Zedek. And the king said, He is a good man, and cometh with good tidings. You see, this is what Joab feared. He says, if he sees you coming, you're going to get his hopes up. But Ahamaz, I'm guessing Ahamaz is probably a young man. He's not thinking clearly. He's caught up with his emotions. And Ahamaz called and said unto the king, all is well. <laughs> all is well, are you kidding? <laughs> and he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? The very first thing David inquires. He doesn't ask about Joab, Abishab. It, uh, he doesn't ask about anybody. He just asks about Absalom immediately. His greatest enemy in the entire world right now. That's all that he cared about. It's his son. And Ahamaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and me, thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. He's not a very good messenger, Ahamaz. And you kind of get the feeling that he's a little timid about actually telling David now. He was very excited. Now he's kind of stumbling over his words. I don't know. It was kind of fuzzy. And, <laughs> you know, and, and he sees the countenance of the king. He sees David's face at this moment. And he sees how grieved that he is. The same thing Joab already knew. And he's starting to realize, yeah, I'm not a very good messenger. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. You see, now the tension's in the air. David, he, he hears that the battle's been won, but what's happened to his son? And David probably sees something in Ahamaz of uh, timidity as well. He's seeing, eh, he's holding something back from me. He's probably getting a bad feeling. You know how those bad feelings creep up on you. And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. He didn't come right out and tell him. He just said, May all your enemies be like that. David immediately knew what he was talking about. I really like Charles Spurgeon's comments on this. It is a father that speaks, talking about David's inquiring of Absalom. And a father's love can survive the enmity of a son. No, he says, he's, you know, David probably remembered looking back on Absalom as a young boy playing with his toys and running through the field and running up and hugging him and all of these things. You know how you remember all those good things. And it's probably just flooding him at this moment and how tragic that life truly is. It's all just so unbearable at this time to David. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Notice he's not calling him anything but his son. He's just looking at him as his son, not his enemy, not his foe, not another king trying to take his throne. He's looking past all of the wrongs that Absalom has done. And he just says, that's my son. Much like how God looks at us. I really like the way this chapter ends. I mean, as much as you can. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Moses, Moses, Martha, Martha, 
Abraham, Abraham, you know, God, he repeats names quite often. And David being the man after God's own heart, you can kind of tell God's heart in this and how it God may look at us as his children as much as we've wronged God. <clears throat> like Absalom wronged David as much as we have, God still looks down and he sees his children. Uh, you know, he uh, that's the only way. And God actually does what David says. He says, O my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom. He says, I wish that I, I would have died in your place, Absalom. God actually did die in our place through Jesus Christ. God actually did that. He loves us that much, and we see that kind of love coming out of David. He says, I would rather die than not have you with me. And it's the same thing that Christ did for us, that the Lord did for us. He says, I would rather die than not have you in my presence forever. That's the love of the true father showing through King David at this time. It's very, very lovely and also very sad, very tragic. But that is the way of the earthly life. And, uh. A sad chapter, sad chapter, but we're going to keep going with it, Lord willing. Tomorrow we're going to pick up in chapter 19. Until then, I hope you all learned something. Thank you all for joining me. God, peace be with you. Amen.